Welcome to 288M. I am your instructor, Robert McMillan, and we are going to have a great term. We're going to have a great class discussing all different types of Windows Server 2016 procedures, and we're going to start using TCP IP from Chapter 1 of our book. So we have here some slides that come from the uh, chapters of each of our uh, uh, reading assignments that you have each week. So let's go ahead and get started by looking at the general network terms. So if we take a look at MAC address, frame, packet, and segment, each of these are different parts of what makes up uh, TCP IP packet. So for the MAC address, basically this is the burned in address that goes on every network card. And although you can change this address using software tools, you can't really remove this physical address. MAC stands for Media Access Control. The next thing is the frame, and it's a formatted unit of data as you see here. So uh, basically when you go to uh, send data using TCP IP, you use a frame and a packet. All of these travel through the OSI model, which you may have learned in Datacom if you have taken that particular course, or you've taken maybe the Network Plus exam. We also have segment, that's the transport layer unit of data. So you've got the network layer and the transport layer, and uh, as the data travels through this OSI model. So typically we refer to uh, our protocol that we use on the internet as TCP IP, but TCP is just one of the protocols that can go over IP. You can also have UDP, which is what a lot of gaming servers use, webcam, streaming video, all those kinds of things you use UDP. So TCP is connection oriented and UDP is connection less. So TCP cares about whether or not the traffic got there. UDP doesn't, it tries, just tries to get it there as fast as possible. They all use what's called port numbers and each of them have over 65,000 port numbers or doorways that you can use to get in, to a, in through a firewall onto a server or a computer. So here's some of the more common TCP and UDP ports that are used for some of the things that we use every day, such as you see HTTP for web traffic, SMTP for email traffic, then you've got secure traffic, HTTPS, that, that would be port 443. So for a lot of these uh, certification tests, you'll have to memorize some of these what's called well-known ports. And uh, these are some of those well-known applications that go along with their TCP or UDP ports. So what's the function of IP? Again, IP is a protocol. TCP over IP, those are two protocols. They just happen to work together. Uh, the, the IP protocol performs logical addressing, ensures efficient packet delivery, although that's the, uh, the TCP mainly uh, portion of that, and provides information needed for packet routing. So if you have a router, it's going to route IP. IP addresses in TCP IP version 4 are 32 bits. So basically that means 2 to the 32nd power. So if you were to use a calculator to look at 2 to the 32nd power, what would you get? Well, you'd get just over 4 billion addresses, which we've used all up. They're, all the addresses are completely used up. And they're divided up into four 8-bit values. So what do we do if they're all used up? Do we, do we just go right to IPv6? Well, internally, we can still use IPv4, and of course, there's still a lot of people using the IPv4 addresses publicly. We just don't have any new ones to hand out. Subnet masks uh, are 32-bit numbers as well, and they determine how many bits are allocated to a network ID. So if you take a look at where it says the example uh, that you see right here, the example IP address 192.168.14.250. So if you get that all out in binary, you can see 11000, etc. So each one of these uh, binary numbers represents a value in decimal. And the subnet mask uh, also has binary values as well. So you can use these binary values in order to come up with what your network ID is. So having your network ID is important because the only way for your other computers to communicate with uh, your computer or your server is if you're on the same network ID or if you have a router that can route from one network to another. All right, so how is the subnet mask used to determine the network ID? Well, 
you use what's called an AND operation. So I'll take a look that you see here, 0 and 0 equals 0, 1 and 0 equals 0, et cetera, et cetera. It seems kind of weird that 1 and 0 equals 0, but that is the way binary math works. The only way to get to a 1 is if you have 1 plus 1. So a lot of this doesn't make sense until you have an application that goes with it. But that's okay. You learn as much as you can, retain as much as you can, take a lot of notes, and later on, these things will come together for you. So finding the subnet mask, the logical AND operation, uh, you've got the uh, binary value. And uh, if you take a look at the AND operation here for the subnet mask, then you're going to get come up with the network itself. So IP address, the mask masks out what the network portion is and the host portion is. And then you end up uh, with the, uh, the end value, which was the network ID itself. So converting uh, binary to decimal, uh, you can see 0 through 9 is used to represent any possible number. So that's uh, 10 possible values. The ones uh, place can be expressed as a number 0 through 9. Multiplied by 10 raised to the power of 0. So a lot of that, again, doesn't mean a lot to you right here. Hang on to this slide because we're going to come back to it later on in the course and you're going to see how this works. IP address classes. So you can see the IP address of 192.168.0.4. That is what's called a class C address, which I'll explain in a little bit. And you see the class C subnet mask of 2553 times dot zero. And then you see the gateway and the DNS server, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So IP addresses are categorized, classes A through E. And uh, this is a real popular uh, type of topic on certification tests as well. So only IP addresses in the A, B, and C classes are going to be available to us. So you cannot assign a D or an E class, uh, it's, it's, uh, which I'll explain in a little bit, but it's reserved. So class A is any value uh, where the first octet starts with a 1 or ends uh, in a 127. Uh, 127 is typically used as the loopback address, so usually we stop at 126. IP registry assigns the first octet, leaving the last three octets to be used for hosts. So what is a host? A host is any device, uh, a computer, a phone, uh, you know, a router, a switch, a server. Those are all hosts, and they all have to talk on the same network if they're going to be in the same internal network. Uh, IP registry assigns the first octet, leaving the last three octets to be assigned to the hosts. So a class B starts at 128 and ends at 191. Same kind of a thing. So a class C has uh, 192, first octet being 192, and it stops at 223. And uh, you end up with more networks but less hosts. So as you go uh, from the left side where you have a class A, you have very few networks but a lot of hosts. Class B is somewhere in the middle, and Class C is uh, very little hosts, a lot of networks. When you get to Class D, it's reserved for multicasting. So multicasting is when uh, you send off, say, a video stream uh, from, to many computers all at once. That is a multicast, whereas a unicast is one-to-one -one computer communication. And Class E is reserved for exper experimental use. Um, so we don't really get access to those. So since we've run out of public addresses, uh, and this happened quite a long time ago, we weren't quite ready to go to the next version of IP, uh, the uh, scientists came up with an idea and said, hey, let's reserve part of our IP addresses in IP ver version 4 for private addressing. So that way I can use the same address at my house or my business that you can use at your house in your business. And uh, so we, they came up with an IP address scheme, uh, reserved IP addresses that are never actually used on the internet. So for instance, where you have the 192.168, you're never going to see out on the internet a public IP address of 192.168. It's only reserved for inside networks. So the same thing with class A and B, you can see all the, cl the class A starting with a 10, they're all considered internal. And class B, you see the 172.16 through the 172.31. So, uh, automatic private IP addressing. 
Now, most IP addresses are handed out through what's called a DHCP server, Dynamic Host Control Protocol. So there's some server or router or switch that has DHCP running on it. So when you go to, uh, say, turn on your computer, if you don't have a static IP address set, which we're going to do in our labs, then it's automatically assigned from a whatever server is available for DHCP. And if the, the computer or the device, uh, which we also call a host, does not uh, have a DHCP server anywhere on the network, then it automatically assigns itself a private IP address called uh, a PIPA, Automatic Private IP Addressing. And you can see here it's going to be assigned to the 169.254.1 network. So what happens is, let's say you don't have a DHCP server anywhere on your network, but you've got five computers. Well, if uh, you have automatic private IP addressing uh, automatically assign these IP addresses, then they can still talk to each other. Can't get out to the internet, but at least they can talk to each other. So NAT, so network address translation. This is how we are able to all use the same IP addresses inside our homes and offices. Because typically you can't have the same uh, IP address out on the internet that somebody else has. Otherwise, there'd be no way to route to that address because the internet would get confused and say, you know, which location do I send to? So if you live on 123 Main Street and somebody next door to you lives on 123 Main Street, then the post office has no idea which house the mail should go to. So that's the same kind of thing. However, with NAT, it's a little bit different. So uh, if I live at 123 Main and you live at 123 Main, uh, but we have a router that masks that we live at 123 Main and really the, the, uh, the masking protects that inside addressing. So uh, on the outside, it looks like we're at two different addresses, but on the inside, we're both using the same addresses. So that's how we were able to push past running out of IPv4 addresses. We're both using the same addresses inside, but we're broadcasting on the outside on completely different, uh, unique public addresses. So here's an example of that. You see the uh, NAT router, and you see uh, out on the internet. On the outside, it looks like uh, we've got our private IP of 10.0.0.1. Uh, I'm sorry, on the, uh, uh, the, on the inside. And on the outside, it looks like we're coming from 198.60.123.101. So we can mask our address. So let's say we've got 20 computers on the inside of our business. And it starts at 10.0.0.1 and goes all the way to 10 By using network address translation, we can all appear to be coming from the same 198.60.123.101. So that's called a many-to-one address translation. However, if you want to do a one-to-one -one trans address translation, as you see here, you see 10 one and 10 two are being translated to two different public IP addresses. It's not as efficient as, uh, say, taking these 20 computers and doing a many-to-one, because you'll run out of addresses a lot sooner. However, if you have a web server and an email server that they need to be on separate IPs, then that would be a reason why you'd want to do a one-to-one. -one. So when the email comes in, it goes to the email server, and when the web uh, traffic comes in, it goes to the web server. So that's why you'd want to have either a many-to-one or a one-to-one. -one. So uh, we also have what's called class-less interdomain routing, as you see here. So we can change a class B address in this example to a class C address. So you can see that the class um, B address here is 172.31.210.10. But if I use a subnet mask that was designed for class C, then I've effectively turned that class B uh, IP address into a class C subnet, which means that uh, with dot 10, only the dot 1 through 254 is usable uh, because that's the, um, the maximum amount uh, and the uh, usable for hosts, whereas 172.31.210 is the network address. So again, I totally understand that this may not make a lot of sense unless you've already been through Datacom or through some networking uh, training in the past. However, Keep these slides available for the tests. Keep these slides available for uh, you know, your work. And these things will fall into place over time. Broadcast domains, they define devices uh, must receive a packet that's broadcast by another device. OK, so what that means is 
when my computer join, uh, connects to a network switch and a server connects to a network switch. How do I find that network switch? I'm sorry, how do I find the uh, server from the network switch? There's got to be a way for my computer to find that server. So we're all connected through the switch. So what happens is my computer, when it says, hey, I need to find server A, it sends out a broadcast packet. It says, where is server A? Are you server A? Are you server A? Finally, server A says, hey, I'm server A, and replies back to your computer. Then the network switch memorizes that information. So the next time you need to find server A, you don't have to broadcast it because broadcast traffic slows everything down. Subnetting, process that reallocates bits from an IP address's host to the network portion. Okay, so on the left side of an IP address, say the 172.20.30, uh, in the, the uh, last case here, or 172.31.210, pardon me, uh, that's the network side. So that means that any other computer that needs to, to communicate with me has to also be on 172.31.210. So in order for us to talk to each other, we have to have the same subnet. Um, however, we cannot all be on the same host IP. So we all have to be on different IP addresses on the host side. So in this case, uh, we see the dot .10. So that means that no other computer can have a dot .10 at the end. It can be 1 through 254, but not dot .10. So subnets divide very large networks into many smaller subnetworks. And that conserves IP addresses. So here's a subnet network, a whole bunch of different examples. You see at the top 172.20.00. And you see the way you uh, measure it out in binary. And then you have your beginning and end uh, network address. So by taking binary, converting it into a subnet mask, you see that I now have 254 usable addresses. Very nice. So 172.20.4, same kind of a thing. It tells me I have 1 through 254. So this is the, the way that subnet masks work. They help us to segment the network side from the host side. Now you see some different uh, network bits, and we see what's called the CIDR notation. So you see on the right-hand side, uh, the CIDR notation basically uh, gives us a shorter view. So we don't have to spell out the entire subnet mask. So what we can do is instead of 255, 255, 255.0, we can just put our IP address, uh, or our subnet IP address, slash uh, 24. So that uh, shows that that's the CIDR, and that's because every octet is worth 8. So 255 is 2 to the 8th power. 255, 2 to the 8th power, 255, 2 to the 8th power. So 8 times 3 is 24. So then we end up with our IP address, slash 24. So you can see here, it, I, the CIDR notations are going to be slash 22, slash 23, or slash 27. And it's all based on that subnet mask or how many bits you have in that subnet mask. Supernetting, definitely we're going to come up on the, t on the uh, quiz. And uh, supernetting sometimes referred to as route aggregation or route summarization, reallocates bits from the network portion of an IP address to the host portion. So you can take smaller subnets and supernet them together into one uh, larger usable network. And there is a formula to make that happen. Uh, so you can take a look in your book to see how you supernet subnets. Uh, this is a little graphic that shows the routing table. So you've got uh, four different smaller subnets. And on the right-hand side, you can see the one larger supernet. <coughs> Rephrase. Rules for IP address assignments. Every IP configuration must have a subnet mask. All hosts on the same physical network must share the same network IDs. As I mentioned earlier, they all have to start with the same numbers on the left-hand side. All hosts on the same network must be unique. So again, on the right-hand side, can't have the same numbers. They have to all be different. Uh, can't assign an IP address in which all host ID bits are binary zero. Got to have at least a number one. And you can't assign an IP address that has all the, the numbers as one, which would be 256. Can't do that because that's your broadcast address. So that's why in a class C subnet, even though it's zero to 255, you can only use 1 through 254. So 1 through 254 are the usable addresses, and then on the outside, the 255 is the broadcast, and on the inside, 0 is the subnet. Windows operating systems allow assigning multiple IP addresses so to a single network connection. 
So if I wanted to, I can assign multiple IP addresses to my network card. So that's useful if your, uh, your computer is, say, uh, being act acting like a router. Or uh, on one side you have one subnet, and on the other side you have another subnet, and you're able to communicate with both of these subnets by assigning more than one IP address to your particular network card. In order to get out to the uh, internet or out to other subnets through a router, you've got to configure a default gateway. A gateway is almost always used in IP address configuration. So if you don't want a computer to go out to the internet, then you don't assign the gateway. Uh, but you have to find out whatever the doorway is out to the world. So let's take your home internet connection. You get something from Comcast. By default, that gateway address is 10.1.10.1. So if your first computer is 10.1.10.2, then to get out to the internet, you have to have a gateway set to .1. So that way you can go out, get your updates, go out, browse the, the internet, etc. There is a routing command in Windows if you don't want to use a, an external router uh, that, where you can route to different subnets uh, internally in your network. So uh, there, the routing command is basically uh, well, route, then you could do uh, the subnet mask, the gateway, etc. of where you want to go. If you just want to show your routing that's going on in your network, type route space print. So when you hit route print, then you see what you see here. You see various different active routes that are going on. So go ahead and do that on your computer. You can see that in our case, we are, our default gateway is 192.168.0.250. That's how we get out to the internet. There's also some other uh, internal routing that you see here. Some of it's automatically configured with Windows. You don't have to do it, it just automatically gets set up that way. Such as the 224 addresses for multicast and the subnet 192.168.0, uh, which is what you're using internally. There's some great command line tools we'll be using in our course. NetSH, IPconfig, ping, ARP, etc. There's going to be a whole bunch of little uh, mini videos that are in each of the labs. So when you get to a portion of the lab where you don't know how to do something, then you'll go ahead and click on the mini video, and some of those videos will show these different tools. If you know how to do something already, you can skip that video. So that way you can get through the lab a little bit more quickly if you don't need it. NetSH is used to set an IP address as well as a whole bunch of other things. Get to know the NetSH command. Uh, it's very useful. You can use it for a lot of different things. What you see here is configuring an IP address uh, on an interface using the NetSH command. And we'll be doing that later on in this course. IP config is very useful. It tells you what your IP address is. It also helps you to release or renew an IP address, uh, flush the DNS so you can get new DNS information right away, as well as other things. Pinging uh, basically tells you whether or not another host is alive. So you can, and there's lots of different switches along with that, but the basic thing is you can just type in ping and whatever the IP address or the name, say google.com, and you'll get a reply back if that uh, device is live. However, if they have a firewall blocking that ping request, then after you run ping, you can type ARP space minus A and the IP address or the name. And what that'll do is it'll say, hey, the firewall's blocking my ping, however, it can't block ARP. So if the device is alive after you ping it and you don't get a response, type ARP space minus A and then the IP address and it'll tell you whether or not it's alive. So uh, that's also a good tip. Traceroute tells you how many hops you, you uh, have, how many routers between you and the device you're trying to get to. Worldwide, you cannot have more than uh, a certain amount of hops because uh, 30 hops is the maximum. Uh, so between us and anywhere else in the world, you're not going to be any more than 30 routers away, which is kind of cool. NSLOOKUP looks up the name server for a host. So if you're wondering, hey, who assigned the name Google.com, you can do NSLOOKUP and then the name Google.com, and then you'll find out what their name servers are. So finding the name server can be very useful for troubleshooting if you're trying to figure out how something got assigned. IP version 6 came out uh, quite a while ago, and it came to as a replacement for IP version 4, but just like the metric system, we're having a hard time getting rid of IP version 4. So it allows us to have larger address spaces, basically about 80 trillion addresses for every person. 
um, which I hopefully we'll never run out of. And uh, it also has built-in security, built-in uh, uh, other tools, which is uh, very useful. The IP address looks a lot different than an IP version 4. So you can see it's written in hexadecimal instead of decimal. So it doesn't use binary, it uses hexadecimal to assign the IP address. And instead of a 32-bit address, it's 128 bits. So 2 to the 128th power, of course, is way more than 2 to the 32nd power. IP version 6 defines unicast, multicast, and anycast devices. So uh, all that will be important in this class is unicast and multicast. And as I mentioned, unicast is a one-to-one -one communication, and multicast is when you want to broadcast out to a lot of different people all at once. There is an IP version 6 auto configuration, just like there is for IP version 4, uh, using um, DHCP. So you can set up an IP version 6 DHCP server the same way you can in IP version 4. And there is a conversion between IP version 6 and IP version 4. There's actually a whole bunch of different types of conversions, uh, depending on which uh, type of technology you're using. But um, there is a way to... Uh, convert. Now, one of the reasons for that is because IP version 4 IP addresses are a subset of IP version 6. So everything that's in IP 6 uh, or everything that's in IP 4 is, is inside IP version 6. All right, we talked all about all different kinds of TCP IP technologies, CIDR notation, some of the different tools. Uh, so now the next step is for you to go ahead and go into your lab after you finish your reading assignment and you can go ahead and get started on your lab. And if you need any help, of course, those mini videos are there. And you can also uh, email the instructor, in this case myself, uh, or you can you know, set up an appointment, uh, send an email, and we can get that going on. So I'm glad you're here in this class. We're going to have a great term. And uh, go ahead and get started. And there's lots of help available for you if you need it.